Hey, AP Psychology students. Today we're going to be looking at operant conditioning. I have these two great video clips that um, I would love to show you, but I don't want to embed them into the um, PowerPoint, and so I will connect them onto our Schoology page. The first one is a dog. It's actually really cute, and any of you that know dogs know that they kind of have guilty faces if they they do something they know is wrong. And the second clip here is from Big Bang Theory, also really illustrates well the concepts we're going to be looking at today. So, um, operant conditioning still deals with a response and stimulus relationship. In classical conditioning, we have two stimuli, and then we have a an unconditioned response and a conditioned response. In operant conditioning, we basically have the response comes first, or the behavior, and it's either weakened or strengthened depending on its consequences or the stimulus. And so I'm going to go over some basic principles of that today, and then we'll look at more examples and processes later on. Uh, this work on operant conditioning actually began with Edward Thorndike, who liked to make contraptions and test on animals. So he created a puzzle box where uh, if the puzzle did uh, require a number of steps for the cat to open it, and there was a treat outside of the puzzle, he noticed that the cat would complete the puzzle quicker and more efficiently and uh, labeled this instrumental conditioning. So the, in other words, the animal's behavior was instrumental in what the outcome was. So if the consequences in general, this is what the law of effect states, are satisfied, then our behavior will increase. If we for example, get uh, a compliment for doing a job well done on an assignment, then we are maybe likely to increase that behavior in the future. If, on the other hand, we're in class and we get yelled at because we're turning around and talking to our neighbor or whatever, uh, perhaps that behavior will decrease. So this is just a general principle that B.F. Skinner um, used as a foundation for his work in operating conditioning. So um, B.F. Skinner was a, a very, very prominent psychologist of the 20th century. And in fact, at the end of the 20th century, he was selected by his colleagues in the American Psychological Association as the most, the single most influential psychologist of the 20th century. His work on operant conditioning involved a lot of work with training animals. And uh, it was very uh, mechanical and methodical, if you will. He even trained some pigeons to pay, play ping pong. And again, I'm not gonna embed that in our clip here, but, um, if you are curious about some of Skinner's uh, training techniques, you can just do a YouTube search and take a look at it there. Um, so he had a contraption here he called the Skinner box, and this is where he would uh, release rewards for the animals that he was training, and or he used pigeons and he had like a little hopper with food in it. So the first principle is reinforcement. Reinforcement is going to always, always, always strengthen a behavior. Now, this doesn't mean that it's a positive behavior. It doesn't mean it's something that we would consider a good behavior, but we still call behavior that's strengthened because a stimulus is added or presented to someone as positive reinforcement. So this could be that you make your bed because you get an allowance, that's positive reinforcement. But also it could refer to a child who is having a tantrum at a store and the parent gives in to them so the child gets what they want, they get that stimulus. I remember seeing a, a little girl at Best Buy just begging and screaming for a Swan Lake Barbie DVD and she got it. So what is she gonna do the next time? that she goes to uh, you know, Best Buy and she wants maybe um, another video or whoever knows what it is uh, and she screams for it, she's gonna get it, okay? So that's positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is still going to strengthen a behavior. This is really, really, really important to know. Um, so th the seatbelt is a really good example of negative reinforcement. We get to escape or avoid something damaging to us, an unpleasant stimulus by wearing a seatbelt. We get to 
uh, escape a ticket, you know, click it or ticket, right? We get to avoid potentially a serious car accident, one that, you know, we, we still might have a serious car accident, but we might not have the serious injuries that would go with the car accident. Um, we get to escape the sound of the buzzer going off in the car. Um, another example of negative reinforcement would be maybe, you know, cleaning up your room to avoid your parents nagging at you, okay? So that is negative reinforcement. Types of reinforcers are a few different types. First of all, we have the primary reinforcers. These satisfy a biological need and they work naturally. This is going to include anything like food or candy or water, and they work best with children, to be quite honest. Um, as we get older, we tend to place more value on what we call conditioned or secondary reinforcers. These are going to be things like money, like an award, a scholarship, recognition of your peers, recognition from your teachers. So anything that you, or grades for that matter, anything that is reinforces your behavior that is not a primary reinforcer, in other words, it's not like candy, is going to be a conditioned reinforcer. Token economies are another example of a conditioned reinforcer, and this is when one in which you complete tasks and you earn stars or points. Uh, these are tokens that can be later exchanged for privileges or treats. A lot of students have an example of this kind of token economy, either from when they were a child at home or from teachers in their younger years of school. Uh, the pre-back principle is another type of reinforcer, but this one is highly individual, first of all, and it is the promise of giving a child the opportunity to have a preferred activity to reinforce a less enjoyable activity. So uh, let's say that they don't want to do their homework. Well, you make an agreement. If you do your homework, you can play Mario Kart, okay? Um, or, you know, like here's an example. Um, Maybe there is someone that really, really likes to read um, and they don't like to go outside. They just want to sit reading their books all day long. I'm, I knew kids like that. Uh, I was maybe one of No, I like going outside too. At any rate, um, let's say that you have a kid that wants to read and you really want them to get fresh air and go outside and exercise. So for them, the pre-mac principle might be you go outside for a half hour and then you can come and inside and read your book okay so keep that in mind now punishment is going to weaken or suppress a behavior so i have of course a belt up here which indicates physical punishment physical punishment we call positive punishment again that might not make sense intuitively but it is positive because something is presented directly to the individual surprisingly physical punishment is uh, something that we're going to see even in parts of our country that is, is still commonly used. Even some schools um, have have rules that you can uh, paddle a child who misbehaves, which just for us here in Minnesota seems kind of um, shocking. However, um, other things can be considered positive punishment. Just getting yelled at, having someone give you a nasty look. Um, having a uh, a criticism, your parents lecturing you, your parents yelling at you, getting the I'm so disappointed in you, or what I've heard a lot in our community, when you say bad words, what happens? You get soap in your mouth, okay? So those are all examples of positive punishment. I'm going to end today with negative punishment. Negative punishment occurs when we merely remove something desirable to weaken behavior. This is also known as omission training. So prison is the ultimate example of negative punishment. You have removed from you your ability to interact with the outside world. You have your freedom removed for you. Parents might use negative punishment by, say, grounding their children or uh, maybe um, taking away car privileges. Uh, anytime you have a privilege taken away from you, then uh, that is a negative punishment.
This is also known as omission training. So uh, those are some examples. I just want to finish briefly. I'm not going to go through over all of these, but I do want to talk about um, some drawbacks to punishment. And one of them is that it doesn't train new behaviors. If you are going to use punishment with your child, let's say they're doing something that you don't want them to do. Uh, maybe they take a toy away from a, a, another child that they're playing with and you give them a timeout for two minutes. But then you go ahead and you train them to share their toys. Um, we need to be careful about using a lot of punishment because there are people that develop really strong negative emotions towards their parent if their parent uses a lot of punishment. And the most uh, critical thing, I think, is when that punishment becomes abusive. And so this leads to inappropriate modeling and generational abuse in about one third of those who were abused as children. I think the most important thing to know about effective punishment is that natural consequences are really the best um, way to train uh, to, to, to diminish a behavior while training a new behavior. So for example, my children, we live about three miles from the high school. And I remember one day I was at work, my husband was gone and my son missed his carpool. Now, if it's, you know, 60 below or something like that, you don't want your kid to walk three miles, but most children can walk three miles. Most teenagers, I don't know that I would, you know, have a, like a six-year-old do it, but, you know, so we had to walk to school. Not the end of the world. It was a nice day. Um, he was late for school. He had the natural consequences for missing his carpool. So that is a, 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 reasonable way is a natural consequence. Of course, you wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that if it wasn't safe or if it was too far or too cold or something like that. But um, just in general, thinking of the natural consequences for behaviors we want to change is going to be the most effective way to change those behaviors. Thank you for your time. And um, we will talk about more examples in class.